today we are going to talk about cell breakage it could be a bacterial or a fungal animal or a plant cell what happens is if your uh, product of interest is held up inside the microorganism then you need to release those product and then perform your purification task so generally biological products could be extracellular like uh, alcohols acids antibiotics and some enzymes it could be intracellular sometimes you have a recombinant dna products it could be periplasmic that means it could be in between also so you can have different types of products being pr produced and depending upon where the product is getting accumulated you may have to resort to breaking the cells and releasing the contents sometimes uh, the release of the product from intracellular to extracellular may be diffusion control and it may take a very long time for you to um, get all the product out so in such a situation also you may resort to cell breakage so if you want to perform a cell breakage type of operation that means if you are interested in recovering an intracellular product then you have extra downstream operations to perform so you need to collect all the cells that is called a cell harvesting and then uh, you need to resort to a cell disruption this could be a mechanical it could be a chemical it could be enzymatic uh, it could be a physical operation we are going to spend um, more time on this particular box the second box and then once you have released the product from the cell you need to filter the cell debris the dead biomass and then the liquid is going to contain your product of interest the metabolite or it could be a protein or it could be a small molecule so here you are having cell debris that's being uh, removed whereas here you are interested in the cells i had talked mentioned before that if it's an extracellular products you are not interested in the cells so cells are removed in the very first stage of filtration but if it's an intracellular product the cells are harvested and then you break the cells and then you collect the liquid part of it which will contain hopefully all your product and the dead cells the broken cells are thrown out so there will be extra downstream operations if you are interested in the intracellular products there are many points you need to consider when you are going to select a technique for disrupting the cells as i mentioned it could be a physical method it could be a chemical method it could be a enzymatic method but uh, you need to consider several points before you decide which technique am i going to follow does the microorganism have a cell wall what are the components present in the cell wall third is the nature of the cell wall is it very strong tough or it's very fragile can i very easily break the cell wall or i need to resort to um, some extra mechanical techniques to break the cell wall so depending upon the strength i may select my technique heat liberation uh, am i going to generate lot of heat if am i going to generate heat as you know enzymes are very susceptible to ther thermal gradients so they may lose their activity so am i going to generate lot of heat then maybe that method is not good i have to go to some other method do i need lot of solvents or any other chemicals for example enzymatic methods or chemical methods will require some extra solvents or chemicals or solubilizers so do i require all these what is the capital cost that means what type of equipment i am going to put in what will be the equipment cost that's called capital cost then comes operating cost how much energy i will require to do this job do i require cooling water do i require uh, inert conditions do i require chilling water so that's the operating cost and the efficiency of the process how efficient is the process ideally if you are interested in the intracellular product you would like to collect 100% of the intracellular material right so you would like to have a 100% efficient process but uh, then that is not so in reality you may have different amounts of efficiency varying from 30 40 50 going up to 70 80 so you would like 
to know the efficiency of the process and sometimes you may have to redo it second time, third time that is called passes. So, you may have a second pass, third pass, fourth pass until you recover all your product. So, you need to know the efficiency of the process. If you are going to do it many passes obviously, the operating cost is very high. So, that is not very favorable. So, if the efficiency is very high, then you will not have many passes. Ease of operation, how easy it is to operate? I am going to talk about a, a bead mill where the operation is very problematic. You need to, uh, perf after the performance, you need to wash the setup, you need to remove the beads and clean each one of them. So, the ease of operation is very, very important. Once I have done the cell breakage, can I use the setup for the next batch and the third batch and so on. What is the waste generated? That means, how much waste apart from the cell debris, um, the dead biomass, the intracellular material, maybe EPS, DNA, how much of waste am I gen generating? Am I gen going to generate lot of waste? Recovery of the product. Once I have done the cell breakage, how easy it is to recover my product? Because I am going to have lot of solid material, lot of viscous material um, and uh, my product of interest is also going to be part of it. Is it going to be very easy to recover? So, I need to consider that aspect as well. Then flow characteristics of the broth. Once you have broken down the cells, the whole solution becomes non-Newtonian. As you know, non-Newtonian fluids behave very differently um, unlike a Newtonian fluid. So, when you apply more uh, shear, the viscosity changes in a non-linear fashion. So, when you have a non-Newtonian fluid, it becomes very difficult for you to do the mixing, pumping, handling, flow and so on actually. So, I am generating a lot of non-Newtonian fluid behavior once I have broken down the cells. So, you need to consider that aspect as well. And then finally, am I releasing toxins? When I do a cell breakage, I am not only releasing products, but uh, am I releasing inhibitors which are going to um, deactivate my protein or enzyme? Am I going to release toxins which are harmful for the product of interest. So, you need to consider that also. So, there are a large number of criteria which you need to consider before you decide on which type of cell breakage equipment you are going to resort to. So, all these are very, very important and all these affect your overall um, plan and overall efficiency of their entire downstream operation. We will talk about some of them in the next uh, course of this lecture as well as possibly the next lecture as well, um, but not all the points. Let us look at uh, some microorganisms. You might have done uh, courses on uh, um, microbiology. So, you already may be knowing the, the structure of the microorganism and what it contains and so on. But it is very, very important in this particular context to know that as well, because as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, you must know what is the composition of the cell wall, uh, how tough it the cell wall is, and the ease of breaking of the cell wall and when you break the microorganism, I am going to generate inhibitors or toxins. So, in order to know all these, you need to understand certain details about the cell walls of uh, bacteria cell walls of yeast, um, animal cells, plant cells and so on. That will give you an idea in selecting the correct equipment. Okay. Let us start from bacteria. You may be knowing about this uh, in your uh, microbiology class as I mentioned before. So, two types of um, <coughs> bacteria, the gram positive and the gram negative. So, it's, it depends um, based on the staining. So, gram positive remain stained by crystal violet even after washing, gram negative do not remain stained after washing. That is how bacteria have been classified into two broad categories. Okay. Uh, why does it stain remain? Why does the stain get removed? That depends because of the presence of the cell wall. We will we'll talk about it as we go along. So, they all have a cell membrane where oxidative phosphorylation takes place and they do not have a mitochondria. Surrounding the cell membrane, there is a cell wall which is uh, rigid and protects the cell from osmotic lysis. So, the cell wall's job is to 
protect. Uh, what does the cell wall contain? It contains polysaccharides, it contains glucans, it contains uh, mannans and chitin. So, the, as you can see glucans, many types of glucans may be present, many types of polysaccharides may be present. So, it is it's a mixture of uh, different molecular weights of these products. So, that is what the cell wall is going to contain in a bacteria. Uh, the gram positive cell wall is made up of a peptidoglycan layer, it is a thick layer when compared to the gram negative correct, whereas gram negative has an additional outer membrane and this outer membrane is the major bacteria, major barrier in this bacteria. Okay. So, there is a difference between the gram positive and gram negative bacteria and uh, that difference you need to consider if you are going to select your breakage equipment, whether my organism is a gram positive or a gram negative. Okay. Uh, this is just a schematic of how a bacteria looks like. So, it is a non compartmentalized interior cell wall and it is made up of a peptidoglycan. Okay. So, it is got a the cell wall. So, gram negative has an outer membrane here then you have the cytoplasm, then you have the nucleoid, then we have the capsule, this is the cytoplasmic membrane here, then you have the ribosome, uh, granular inclusions are present here, flagellum, um, pili and so on. So, this is a typical schematic of a bacteria. Now, let us look at the difference between a gram positive and the gram negative bacteria. <coughs> so, you have a uh, both of them have this uh, peptidoglycan, but the gram negative has a outer membrane okay, here, whereas a gram positive does not have a outer membrane. So, that is the difference between both these bacteria. And the region between the inner and the outer membranes, this is known as the periplasmic space. Sometimes uh, your uh, product of interest may be found in the periplasmic space, it is not exactly in the interior of the microorganism. Um, that means intracellular, but it is also not in the extra, but it may be in the periplasmic space. So, but still you need to break the microorganism, but you do not have to break it too much, because it is not uh, inside the microorganism unlike the intracellular material. So, you can resort to slightly milder cell breakage techniques, if your product is in the periplasmic region understand if the product is inside intracellular then you need to really break it very hard. Uh, gram negative bacteria store degradative enzymes in the periplasmic state space, because uh, uh, they do quite a lot of degradation of uh, the various uh, carbon sources extracellularly. So, they store the degradative enzymes which gets released in the extracellular space for degrading its um, carbon source. Gram positive bacteria lacks this uh, periplasmic space, but they also secrete certain exoenzymes and it carries out the extracellular di digestion actually. So, gram negative has um, degradative enzymes in the periplasmic space, whereas uh, this one secretes exoenzymes and carry out the extracellular digestion. Let us look at sizes of uh, these microorganisms, it is very important to know because I can select my equipment based on the size. So, gram positive bacteria are about 0.5 to 2 micron in size and they have cell walls of about 0.02 to 0.04 micron thick. The cell wall is made up of as I mentioned uh, peptidoglycan, polysaccharides and taconic acid. Now, if you look at gram negative, it is about 0.5 to 1 micron in size and this peptidoglycan layer is very, very thin. This also has a periplasmic space. Okay. These are less mechanically less robust. That means, I, if I use a mechanical method, I can easily break gram negative bacteria when compared to gram positive bacteria, but they are chemically more resistant than gram positive. So, if, if I want to resort to chemical methods, then gram positive bacteria are more susceptible than gram negative bacteria, you understand. So, if I want to resort to mechanical methods, uh, gram negative bacteria or uh, less robust, so they can be easily broken down when compared to gram positive. If you want to use a chemical method, then gram positive is more susceptible than gram negative bacteria. So, uh, I can select 
either the mechanical or the chemical method depending upon whether it is a gram positive or a gram negative bacteria. Okay. Now, let us uh, look at yeast. Yeast is uh, slightly bigger 2 to 20 micron in size. They are generally spherical in shape or sometimes ellipsoidal and they are quite tough when compared to bacteria. Then we have things like molds, they are very big, they are filamentous. You can have molds, a filamentous mold and they can have a very thick wall and the plasma membranes are mainly made up of uh, phospholipids. So, if you want to break yeast or molds, you need to resort to much higher shear stresses when compared to the bacteria and molds if you are going to have a filamentous uh, um, material also present, it may um, get entangled in certain mechanical agitators. So, that is a very important point you need to consider. Uh, this is a typical schematic of a yeast. So, you have a mitochondria here, this is the cell wall as you can see, then you have the cell membrane, you have the cytoplasm, then you, you have the nucleus here and uh, as I said the yeast are much bigger than the gram positive or the gram negative bacteria. Now, let us look at plant cells, they are quite big, they have thick and strong cell walls composed of cellulose. So, because cellulose is very tough, breaking plant cells is a big challenge. That is why um, you have to have certain enzymes maybe which can break uh, this type of uh, cellulosic material or you can have uh, mechanical equipment which produces very high shear so that it can break the tough cellulosic uh, surface of the cell wall. But if you are culturing plant cells, then they will be less robust uh, and they can be easily broken down. So, uh, cultured plant cells are much more advantageous if you are interested in looking at the intracellular products. Size of animal and plant cells uh, generally vary between 1 to 100 microns. So, you see they are very big. If you go to animal cells, they do not have cell walls. So, that means they are very, very fragile. So, even cultivating them is a big uh, challenge. If you are going to use mechanical agitator, animal cells can get uh, sheared and broken down. So, generally in one pass in a cell disruptor at about 2000 psi, I can break uh, animal cells. Whereas, if I are looking at uh, blood cells, insect blood cells, um, they will require much higher pressure and if you are looking at yeast cells, you will require almost 20,000 psi and if you are looking at plant tissue when you want to break it, you are talking about 40,000 psi. So, you see the pressure required to break cells starting from animal to insect blood cells going to yeast cells going to plant tissue, we are talking an increase of the order of uh, 20. So, animal cells do not have cell walls, so they are very fragile, they are micron in size. So, as I mentioned uh, before, um, cultivating animal cells in agitated fermenter is a real challenge because they will easily break uh, and form debris. So, you need to use uh, reactors which does not use mechanical agitation. They are spherical or ellipsoidal in shape, they are eukaryotic uh, cells. They are enclosed by a plasma membrane and they contain membrane bound nucleus and organelles. So, a typical plant cell, this is a schematic, you have the cell wall here, you have the chloroplast with the chlorophyll, then you have the vac vacuole, you have the cytoplasm here, this is the cell membrane, then you have the nucleus, this is a typical plant cell. Uh, typical animal cell, you have a very thin cell membrane, then you have the nucleus lysosomes are present here, then mitochondria, cytoplasm, uh, vacuole. So, you can see a lot of difference between each one of these cells starting from bacteria, the gram positive, gram negative going down to yeast, going down to molds, going down to animal cells and finally, to the plant cells, they are very tough business the plant cells. So, there are different 
ways of breaking the cells. You can resort to mechanical methods, you can resort to chemical methods, you can resort to thermal methods, you can resort to biochemical methods. When I mean biochemical, you may be using enzymes to break uh, the cell wall. Each method has its advantages, disadvantages, cost components and so on actually. So, you can select, there is nothing like one single method which is universally acceptable, you can select the method depending upon all the factors I mentioned in the very second slide. So, breaking of the cells, you can use a high pressure homogenizer, we will talk about each one of them slightly in detail in the subsequent slides. Bead mill, you can use osmotic shock, you can use thermal methods, you can use enzymes, you can use chemical detergents, that means uh, certain anionic or cationic surfactants. You can use solvents like toluvin, you can use urea, you can use even antibiotics, lyotic agents, you can use even ultrasonication, freeze thaw cycling, that means you cool it and then you heat it, you cool it and heat it. So, that is called freeze thaw cycling. So, by doing that, you may be able to break. So, you see. Uh, there are so many different mechanical, chemical, thermal and biochemical methods are there and under each category you will have several different methods. So, ultimately you may have a choice of about 20 methods available to you and you can select based on the type of uh, organism you are de dealing with and type of uh, product quantities you are dealing with. So, when you are breaking the cells, you are liberating lot of nucleic acid during the cell breakage. So, obviously, they increase the viscosity. So, when the viscosity is increased, it is not a Newtonian type of behavior, it becomes non-Newtonian and handling non-Newtonian fluid in mechanical agitators, pumping non-Newtonian fluid is always a big challenge. So, sometimes uh, you may heat the material and then cool it, that is called the heat shock treatment that will denature your DNA, RNA, thereby you can prevent the viscosity. It sounds easy, but then when you are heating it, you may be denaturing your product also. If your product is enzyme or protein, the product itself may be getting denatured. So, you need to be very careful about it. So, um, you have to uh, understand that the viscosity of the broth uh, after cell breakage is going to rise considerably and it is always a non-Newtonian type of behavior. Let us look at uh, various techniques slightly in more detail. This is called a bead mill. As the name implies, it is got metal beads inside. It could be ceramic beads, it could be stainless steel beads, uh, it could be iron beads. So, you have several beads present inside this. This is a cylindrical tubular equipment, it rotates the slurry containing your cells are taken inside and as it rotates, it tumbles and the metal beads hit the cells and because of the mechanical contact, mechanical attrition, mechanical force, the cells break. So, that is the principle of the bean mill. So, it is slowly revolving around its major axis, this is the major axis and as it revolves, it tumbles, the solid hits the cells and the cells break down. Generally, the RPM is around 1500 to 2250 RPM, bead diameter is about 0.2 to 1 mm size bead and as I said, the material of construction depends upon the um, importance of your product, how um, you, whether you, you, per, you can permit contamination or whether you want totally contaminant free operation. So, you may select material according to that. If you take ceramic, ceramic is pretty tough and uh, it can it can in impart a shear to the surface of the microorganism. So, it may be useful for very tough walls. If you want lot of force, then you may go for metallic type of beads like uh, stainless steel or iron. Uh, it can handle cell concentrations of about 30 to 60 percent wet solids. So, it can process quite a lot of material, but one main disadvantage 
of this is after the operation I have to completely clean because I may have dead cell debris, I may have exopolysaccharides all stuck inside um, and that needs to be cleaned so that it does not contaminate the next batch. So, it, the um, cleaning operation takes up quite a lot of time. Another disadvantage is temperature, there is a tremendous increase in temperature because this is a mechanical operation and metal beads or ceramic beads hit each other, they also hit the walls of the mill, they also hit the microorganism. So, there is a um, very high temperature generated inside. So, if you do not cool the contents, you may denature the proteins or any biomolecules that are produced or that are liberated during this operation. So, if you are wanting to perform two passes of bead mill, then you need to cool after one pass and then the cooled product is again fed into another bead mill. So, the release process is generally we can assume it as a first order process. That means, the concentration of uh, the product of interest that is the product which is uh, released or liberated from the microorganism as a function of time t here is equal to C naught. This is the total concentration of the product that may be present multiplied by 1 minus exponential power minus k t. k is just like your first order, it is a first order rate constant. So, the concentration will slowly rise with a function of time exponentially and it will reach a maximum. Um, generally, we can assume it as a first order because uh, it is a good approximation to take care and we will do some problems making use of this uh, particular e equation. Let us look at uh, another technique by which you could uh, break uh, these cells, that is called a cell disruptor. So, what you do is you are feeding in the slurry, the slurry means the solution which contains your cells at a very high pressure using a hydraulic pump. There is a small opening here and there is an impinging seat here and on the other side downstream the pressure is low. So, here this is a high pressure chamber, this is a low pressure chamber. So, the slurry at very high pressure enters this nozzle, expands, it hits the impinging seat and then it expands into the low pressure region. So, many things happen during this process, that is how the cells break. Impingement on the valve seat, so the cells hit the valve seat, high turbulence and shear created in this nozzle region, compression produced because the slurry has to enter and flow through the small nozzle and sudden pressure drop, you have high pressure, you have a low pressure. So, sudden pressure drop, so all these add up to break the cells, that means damage the cells. So, the cell walls break and the intracellular products are released. This method is slightly better than the bead mill because it does not produce so much heat, but even this also produces heat, but it is not so much as your the bead mill which is totally mechanical type of operation. So, here you produce, you generate very high pressure, we are talking in terms of 2000, 4000 or even 20000 psi depending upon the type of uh, organism which you would like to uh, disrupt. So, this is called a cell disruptor. So, enzymes, proteins are released at various rates depending upon where they are located inside the cell. So, if they are located in the periplasmic region, they are released very fast, whereas they are located inside the cellular body, then they are released slowly. So, you may have uh, a fast releasing products which are in the which are coming out of the periplasmic region and you may have slowly slow releasing products which are coming from the interior of the cell. Uh, so, you should know where your product is uh, located, so that you will be able to monitor the product as a function of time. If you have unbound intracellular proteins, then they are released in a single pass. If they are membrane bound enzymes or proteins, then you need to break the membrane, so that the membrane bound proteins are uh, released. So, you need to 
uh, resort to several passes through the disruptor. That means you take out the product, then uh, you need to cool the product, again pressurize it, again pass it through the disruptor and so on. So, you may have to resort to 2, 3, 4, 5 times through the um, mechanical disruptor until all the product which is bound to the membrane is released. So, the rate of cell disruption, rate of cell disruption means d c by d t, where c is the concentration, t is the time. So, d c by d t is proportional to v raised to the power 1 by 3, v is the velocity of the slurry uh, flow and delta p is the pressure which you are applying. Okay. So, it is quite obvious and c is the concentration of the product that is being released actually. You can reduce this to a much simpler equation of this form c equal to c naught raised to the power 1 minus exponent minus k n. C is the amount of protein or enzyme or product that is released as a function of time. C naught is the maximum amount of this protein present inside, n is the number of passes through the homogenizer, one pass means n will be 1, two passes n will be 2 and so on. Now, this k depends upon the type of microorganism or also the operating pressure. So, for example, k equal to k dash p raised to the power 2 pi 2.9 for saccharomyces or k equal to k dash p raised to the power 2.2 for E coli. So, the exponent varies depending upon the type of uh, microorganism present here. Actually. So, you see this release depends upon the number of passes, it depends upon the type of uh, microorganisms, it depends upon the pressure you are applying. So, obviously, this uh, relationship will again be raised going up exponentially as a function of time. Okay. <coughs> so, we can assume that the proteins are getting released um, or the intracellular product coming into the extracellular region as a function of time in a very exponential manner. So, C is equal to C naught 1 minus E minus T by tau, tau is the time constant for cell release or tau is also equal to related to the rate constant. This is like a, this is a first order relationship. So, you can have c equal to c naught multiplied by 1 minus e minus k t also, okay, because this is a first order relationship. c naught is the maximum concentration of the product present inside and it is getting released slowly as a function of time and this is assumed as a first order relationship which is given by this particular equation and the it, this is a typical first order relationship and tau is called the time constant for the cell release. So, tau will have the same units as t. So, if t is in minutes tau also will be in minutes, if t is in hours tau also will be in hours. So, you have to remember that units are the same. Let us look at a problem here that will explain or that will clarify some of the points which we talked about related to homogenization as well as the product release as a function of time. So, what we are doing is we are homogenizing a cell suspension to release enzymes present. So, 50 percent of the total present is released in 8 in 8.3 liters in 16 minutes. So, how long will it take to release 90 percent of the total amount? This is a very very important uh, data to have. Right. So, if I am uh, having a set of uh, um, cells and I am interested in breaking it and releasing the intracellular products, how long should I wait so that I am sure all the intracellular product is released into the medium. So, in order to do that I can assume it as a first order relationship right. c equal to c naught multiplied by 1 minus e raised to the power minus t by tau as I said tau is by release constant c naught is the maximum amount that is present inside the intracellular region. Now, the data that is given is 50 percent of the total present is released in 16 minutes. 
Okay, so I can put C by C naught as 0.5, I can put T as 16. So, when I do the calculation here, I will end up calculating time tau, the time constant for cell release as 1.16 divided by logarithm of 1 minus 0 0.05 that comes to around 312 minutes. So, this is the time constant for cell release. So, this time constant depends upon the equipment, it depends upon the type of organisms I am using, it depends upon the pressure I am operating, all those things. So, everything is condensed or uh, encapsulated in this particular number tau. So, using this I would like to know how long it will take to release 90 percent of the material. So, what do I do? I, I put it back. So, C by C naught will be 0 0.9 correct and tau is 311.9, then I have to calculate this T. So, T comes out to be 718 minutes. So, you see if I if I am interested in getting 50 percent out, I wait for 16 minutes, but if I want 90 percent, I need to wait for 718 minutes. So, if I am interested in 95 percent, it may go to about 1000 minutes and if I want 99, it may go to 2000 or 3000 minutes. Why is it so? Because we are assuming a first order type of relationship. So, because it is exponential, it will be slowly moving as you go further and further, as you reach 90, 92, 95, 98, the time taken will be very, very, very large. So, it may be easy to collect the sample um, at smaller quantity, whereas uh, if you are interested in collecting the entire quantity, you may have to wait for very long time and it might not be very economical. So, for example, here 50 percent is collected in 16 minutes. But whereas, uh, for 90 percent as you can see, it will require almost 718 minutes that is a very long time. So, from 16 minutes it has gone up to 718 minutes. So, if we want to reduce the time what can we do? Either we can increase the pressure correct or you can uh, modify the equipment. So, you can think of different other methods rather than using the same setup and waiting for a very long time. Okay, let us go, go forward. There is something called homogenizer. So, how does this work? So, it has got stators here and there is a piston which moves in and out, in and out. Okay. So, when the piston is moving out, it creates a vacuum here, low pressure here. So, the cell suspension comes in, agreed? This valve opens, so the cell suspension comes in. When the piston is pushed up, what happens? The slurry is forced through very, very small hole here and these two valves open, so they are pushed out at tremendous pressure because you are pushing it out through a small nozzle. So, the cells break that is what is the homogenizer and the next time when the piston is pulled down, low pressure is created, these two valves close and the this valve opens, suspension comes in. So, it is almost like your um, piston in your car. Okay. So, in your car when the piston moves in one direction, petrol comes in, when the piston moves in another direction. Um, that petrol gets ignited becomes a gas and so on. So, here when the piston moves down the cell suspension comes in and then the piston pushes up. So, the slurry is pushed through small nozzle and during that process the cells break. So, the ruptured cells move out through these nozzles. So, this is called a homogenizer. So, just like we had a relationship between um, C naught sorry C that is the concentration of the product observed in the extracellular region as a function of time, we can also have a relationship between the uh, concentration of the product um, in the extracellular region as a function of number of passes. So, if I keep increasing the number of passes through the homogenizer or cell disruptor, you are going to collect more material and generally 
it follows a if exponential type of relation that is a first order type of relation okay it's a it's a good approximation to consider now i have also shown something called cf generally the concentration of the product in the extracellular region will be slightly lower than what is expected because there could be some deactivation of the product protein or enzyme because of the increase in temperature because as the temperature increases the enzyme may be getting deactivated. So, instead of having a quantity following this particular graph it may be following this particular graph because there is a denaturization or deactivation of the enzyme taking place because of the rise in temperature inside the mechanical system like a disruptor or a homogenizer. So, our goal is to keep the temperature uh, rise to a minimum, so that you do not deactivate your protein, but still there is going to be some de deactivation taking place because of the rise in temperature. So, if you are thinking of many passes after each pass the product is externally cooled and then again put back, so that the heat uh, that is liberated or generated or accumulated is completely dissipated. Otherwise the activity of the enzyme or the protein will go down and because of the tremendous amount of heat that is uh, generated inside this mechanical system. The loss in activity because of the increase in temperature can be also modeled assuming a Irenaeus type of behavior. So, you all must have done maybe in uh, first year Irenaeus relationship right. So, generally it takes this particular form k that is the rate constant that is the observed rate constant will be equal to the theoretical rate constant multiplied by E raised to the power minus E d by R t. E d is called the activation energy for deactivation divided by R t. R, R is your universal gas constant and T is your operating temperature. So, depending upon the operating temperature this value will be less if the temperature is high this value is going to go down correct if the temperature is low this value will be higher and also it will depend upon the deactivation activation energy. The temperature rise is generally of the order of 1.5 degrees for every 1000 psi. So, if the pressure increases uh, for every 1000 psi there will be the temperature rise inside your uh, homogenizer or any mechanical instrument equipment will be about 1.5 degree centigrade. So, we can use this particular equation to calculate what will be the apparent rate constant of release of the product if the product gets deactivated because of the rise in temperature understand. For example, let us look at this problem this combines both aspects the release of the intracellular product it follows a first order kinetics the deactivation of the product because of the increase in temperature that follows a Arrhenius behavior. So, I can combine both this and tell what will be the actual concentration of the desired product. Okay. Let us look at this problem assume a protein deactivating and it follows a first order kinetics with activation energy of 3 kilo cals per mole. Now, this protein release is a first order kinetics with the release rate constant is equal to 0.1 per hour and the maximum concentration of the intracellular protein is 10 millimole. Estimate the amount of protein recovered using this operation at 50 degree centigrade and 5 hours that means after 5 hours how much protein you will collect if you are doing it at 50 degree centigrade. Okay. So, the protein release is following a first order kinetics it is given here right. So, we we talked about this equation quite a lot C is equal to C naught multiplied by 1 minus E raised to the power minus k t. Now, C naught is 
10 millimole correct. Now, your k if there is no deactivation will be 0.1 per hour and time is 5 hours. So, I can put in all these and I, I get it as 3.93 that means, at the end of 5 hours if there is no deactivation taking place I just put the numbers here and show that I will be collecting 3.93 millimoles of the product or the protein. Now, if the release rate is also affected because of deactivation, because of the increase in temperature, then let us consider an Arrhenius type of relationship as I showed in the previous slide k f is equal to k into E power minus E d by R t, E d is your deactivation activation energy which is given as 3 kilo cal per mole R is equal to 1.98 calories per gram mole per Kelvin, I hope you all know that. So, I have put 0 0.001 here, temperature is 50 degrees centigrade, so 273 plus uh, 50 degrees 323 K and in the absence of deactivation the, the K value is 0 0.1. So, I can put in all these data inside and calculate my K f. So, you see that comes out very very small and if I substitute that K here for 5 hours I will get a product release as 0 0.0457 millimole. So, if there is no deactivation at the end of 5 hours I will be collecting 3.93 millimole of the protein and if I assume a deactivation if I assume a constant rate of deactivation and it, it behaves in this fashion that means an Arrhenius type of behavior then the amount of protein I will be collecting at the end of the 5 hour will be very very small you can see the difference because of the deactivation of the protein uh, because of the temperature here. So, you see that temperature will play a very important role in the amount of product you are going to collect at the end of the process. That is why many of the mechanical agitator may have inline cooling that means, there might be cooling facility inside the equipment itself. So, that the temperature rises uh, practically minimal maybe 1 or 2 degrees not uh, in terms of large values. The next uh, mechanical based cell breakage is called the French press. French press is used for a disintegrating chloroplast, it can be used for blood cells, it can be used for unicellular organism, animal tissues and several other biological solids. The interesting thing about French press is it will just disrupt the cellular walls and it will keep the nucleus intact. So, how it works is it produces a very high pressure and rapid decompression. So, there is not much damage caused by this method unlike the bead mill or any other type of a mechanical method actually. So, you what you do is you produce very very high pressure and you suddenly reduce the pressure that is how it works actually. So, you are talking in terms of uh, almost 40,000 psi. So, a motor driven piston inside a steel cylinder develops this type of pressure and then this high pressure slurry is bled through a needle valve. So, when you bleed it through a needle valve you are achieving a, a very fast decompression and during this process the cells break, but the nucleus remains intact the temperature rise is not as dramatic as in the other mechanical methods which I talked about actually. But basically this uh, also involves high pressure and a low pressure operation. So, we talked about different types of uh, mechanical operations um, which can help you to disrupt your cells or break your cell walls and release the contents and then uh, during the process 
I said increase in temperature is a very, very important uh, point to note and when the temperature rises, if you assume a deactivation of a biomolecule um, based on arrhenius type of behavior, then the rate constant of release gets affected because of the deactivation. So, the amount of product that gets released during this operation will be much less because of the increase in temperature, which in turn affects your rate constant, which in turn affects your product release rate. So, you have to decide on which type of mechanical te technique you want to resort to if you want to break cells and whether the uh, product can withstand this increase in temperature. And when compared to the bead mill or when you compare to homogenizer, French press is uh, uh, better because the amount of uh, temperature rise you will observe in this equipment is much less when compared to the equipment like bead mill. Bead mill also requires more uh, uh, cleaning and after the uh, process. So, it consumes the overall batch cycle time is also much larger when compared to some other technique. Okay. So, now mechanical operations are although problematic, they are quite cheap and they are quite robust and uh, easy to handle. That is why in large scale operations, that means during scale up, um, many groups prefer mechanical based cell disruption methods rather than uh, chemical or enzymatic methods, because they are quite cheap, they can be easily scalable, um, they can be easily handled and the ease of operation is also uh, much better when compared to other techniques. 